Hello, everybody, and welcome to Theory Underground. What you're about to hear is a conversation that took place during the September 18th Epic Marathon stream with Terrence Blake. Anything you want to say about that, Nance? So in this talk with Terrence, we got Leo Tarded. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, uh, no, he, he, he did, uh, I think, an amazing and fantastic unfolding or unpacking of Leotard, Sarah, and Latour. And for me, it got me really, really, really excited. I already had Leotard on my list of things to read, and I added Sarah um, and Latour to my list of things to, I didn't add them. I bumped them up the list. Right. right, um, right. Latour was already on there. Sarah was near the bottom. Now these three French thinkers um, have been moved up the list because the way he unpacked it, the way he broke it down and explained it to me, like I'm an idiot, um, really was really amazing. I haven't seen it done elsewhere. No. Um, no, we and, get into yeah, the three, Terrence, not just these three lesser known French theorists, but each one of them has three phases. And exactly. So the fact that Terrence is able to usher us into their work and give us their three phases. Oh my God, that saves so much time. Yeah. And it provides, it provides a map for study. It, it, he provided us with a tool for being a student that is going to accelerate our ability to read and comprehend what's going on. What, like, what are these theorists doing? What are they talking about? Why are they saying these things that they're saying? Like, um, those are priceless tools to have. And he, he did it for three separate thinkers. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, I guess I'll just, uh, close out for now by saying that all three of them are very important to different aspects of the theory underground, uh, ongoing research projects and, uh, that there's potentially a lot of, uh, almost want to say synergy or something between Ser and everything that I see going on over here with Lumen, right? Between a sort of cis social system theory approach and what Sarah's doing. And so, yeah. And then obviously everything with Latour is so important to sociology, anthropology, post-class fractured mass, all of it. So yeah, everybody, I, I think you'll really enjoy this one. And uh, if you're, if you're not familiar with Terrence Blake, we don't bother introducing him. We kind of assume you've already watched the video where we do, int where we actually interview him and get to know about his, um, how, how he got into French theory and uh, how Lyotard wrote him a letter of recommendation and how he studied under Deleuze and how he's been in France, you know, translating French theory for the last 40 years and the kinds of courses he's been taking at Theory Underground. And in a lot of ways, you know, he, he might be taking classes from us, but we look up to him in a lot of ways. And for the course that I've been teaching on totality and infinity, the first half of which ended recently and the second half of which begins at the beginning of 2025, um, Terrence was and is instrumental to how I'm researching uh, Levinas and, and, and teaching Levinas because on the the day after the deep, the, the deep dive I do into the notes with the students, you know, so I do a kind of like general lecture uh, that for people who might not have done the reading or might not do the reading, then I do a deep notes dive for people who have done the reading. Well, then the day after that, Terrence joins us and we do tarrying with the text because Terry is actually uh, a, a sort of nickname in, in Australia that he goes by. And so uh, tarrying with the text where we get into issues of translation and you know these have proven absolutely indispensable. And so we have a deep... Uh, respect and affection for for Terrence, aka Terry. And so, uh, anyway, with that said, yeah, go make sure to go watch uh, our interview with him, where he talks about his background. But that's not a prerequisite for understanding or getting something out of this. This you can just trust us. He's amazing, and let's get to it. All right, and welcome to Theory Underground, everybody, to the Epic Marathon live stream that is happening on September eighteenth, twenty twenty four. Today we're joined by. Terrence Blake of Agent Swarm. Great to have you back. How are you doing, Terrence? Hello, Dave and Nance and everyone. Uh, everything's fine. Um, 
uh, we had a, a two month heat wave, supposedly um, in Nice, supposedly um, tropical um, weather, especially at night for two months. And now um, there's a, um, usually at the beginning of, of September, there's a, a week long uh, a series of storms and rain that gets rid of all the Taurus and the sun comes back and um, uh, it's slightly less hot. So it's very comfortable now and um, there's more room on the beach and to walk around. Nice, nice, nice. And so, uh, nice, I should say nice, nice, nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's so great to have you. Uh, we wanted to talk about lesser known French theorists. They're lesser known in the American theory scene, at least online. Uh, Latour, Serres, or Serres. I don't, I, I'm going to ask you about pronunciation and Leotard. Did I say their names correctly? Yes. Um, because we did do some French, um, last year, didn't we? Uh, Michel Serres. Uh, Serres. Does that turn out, um, in mirror writing, um, on the yes. screen? We can see it. We can see it. Ah, so um, you don't pronounce the S in French. So Michel Serre. Um, I think people in English say Michel Serres, um, unless they want to show they've got knowledge of French. Mm. So uh, Bruno Latour, uh, where do I have? Um, his big book. So that's easy. Yeah. Uh, in this is my English teacher coming out. Um, in English, there are two accents uh, concerning the R: the rhotic R H O T I C, where you pronounce the R at the end. Many Amer American accents are like that. So Latour, um, Latour. I can't even do it. Um, many English accents don't pronounce the R, or that the R just changes the way the vowels are pronounced. Bruno Latour, if you want to do something um, that sounds slightly more French, it's um, Bruno, the uh, first R you hear more in the throat than in the mouth, but don't overdo it. And um, uh, Latour, um, I have trouble still after 40 years of pronouncing the R in, 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 the, in the middle of a word, but Latour, I'm more inclined to pronounce it in the throat than um, in the mouth. So we're just at the end of a word. And who who else do we say? Uh, Lyotard was a similar thing. Um, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, you don't pronounce the D at the end. Uh, and you pronounce the R like um, Latour and Serre, uh, uh, slightly uh, in the throat. Okay. Latour. Uh, La tour. It's probably a long ooh, La tour. Lyotard, accent or stress on the last syllable. And Michel Serre, um, there's just one syllable for his um, family Serre. name. So that's easy. Okay. And don't pronounce the S at the end. Wonderful. And I think the biggest correction would just be not saying Leotard. <laughs> and so, because it <laughs> sounds retard, Leotard. I'm yeah, sure exactly. Insulting. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So with all of that said, then, um, we're going to do this in three different segments and who would you like to start with first? Uh, Lyotard, uh, because, um, he's well known, but often only partially. So I want to show, unfortunately I, I've chosen books that are in French, but, uh, uh, I mean, that are translated into English, but I can only show them in French because uh, it's too, expensive for me to buy uh, books, um, uh, all my books in, in French and then in English, although sometimes it's an improvement in English um, because of the critical apparatus and sometimes the translator, if it's a good philosophical translator, he um, uh, de or she decodes things and does a, a preliminary um, amount of work. Uh, the first one is uh, Economy Libidinal, Libidinal Economy. His evil uh, book. That was published, sorry? 
what he called his evil book or his wicked book, right? Yeah, I don't know why he said that. Um, <laughs> I, he, uh, he was he was criticized, but um, the thing with Leo is he's always going for the most extreme position and if you're not as extreme as his idea of the extreme um you're not good uh an example is he discusses um uh proust and james joyce proust has a rememoration at the end so that's not as extreme as james joyce in in um uh, Ulysses and Finnegan's way. So he's always going to prefer the um, the most extreme versions of anything. And so Economy Libidinal came out in 74, 1974, in two years after Antioedipus. So he attempts to go further. There's a, a sort of dogmatic apparatus um, uh, that he finds in Antioedipus, and he can consider that he was already um, doing stuff like that before. So um, uh, he's just um, going one step further. Uh, it's evil, I think, because there was some criticism, which he accepted, that um, uh, there was no um, it was way to do, exclude um, fascism in terms of um, uh, a libidinal, pure libidinal economy. There was no ethical dimension to it, the, and so no real um, uh, political uh, dimension to it, despite it talking about politics that uh, um, seemed to um, relativize everything. And he took that very seriously. And uh, a few years later, he came up, um, so that's 74, so maybe nine years later, um, he published The Different, which um, drops intensities that were the main libidinal intensities that were the, the main focus of um, uh, libidinal economy and that he developed the metaphysics of intensities, as he came to call it, the metaphysics. Um, when he was doing it, he thought he was going beyond metaphysics. Afterwards, he decided that it was um, metaphysical. And um, he uh, had uh, an ontology of what he calls phrases or sentences. And he was very much under the influence of uh, Levinas. And he wanted to find a way of it. This was his solution to um, the problem that he neglected ethics. And so he wanted to find a way of incorporating um, his earlier work, but within a, a space where um, the um, ethical phrase was um, included um, and the libidinal economy he regarded as just um, sort of one move, one possible move in the language game of metaphysics and um, beyond or incommensurable with metaphysics, there's ethics and um, he distinguishes a, a, a few other um, types of phrase. And I think um, this is interesting because I think it's an unacknowledged um, influence on Bruno Latour. Uh, but maybe I can sort of uh, mention why when we get to Bruno Latour. Uh, the problem with um, uh, the different, which you have to read. I'm I'm showing only show books that everyone has to read because they're um, masterpieces. Um, even if um, they have been criticised, and the thinkers themselves have um, uh, done their uh, self criticism and tried to go beyond. So um, the problem with uh, the different is that it seems to turn everything into language, and um, when people made this objection um, face to face with Lyotard, he just poo pooed it as if it was um, stupid. But um, he was constantly uh, grappling with that, just as he had constantly grappled with the ethical objection for uh, 10 years. And his answer to that is um, 
a philosophy of painting, and it's no longer even developed in a particular um, uh, separate work. It's um, developed in a series of monographs on individual painters. So they're being um, uh, published in a series, which is very pretty. Um, this one's on um, Sam Francis. It's They're bilingual, and they they cost too much. So I bought a couple because they were the cheaper ones. The other ones you would have to consult in um, uh, a, a library. And um, they're uh, assemblages, anthologies of different uh, texts that he wrote. But there he's trying to get to the moment that art or painting in particular, he considers, allows you to get to where the phrase is stopped and you get to um, pure presence with a capital P or pure matter. So that's his way of um, uh, replying to the objection that um, his philosophy of phrases leads to some sort of uh, linguistic idealism. Uh, seems to be saying that, no, that's one very useful tool of analysis when you're dealing with discourse, but um, he is not going to turn it into a metaphysics. Um, he realizes that there's something else going on, but that is it's hard to get at. But there is that the last phase is very little known because um, it was published in dribs and drabs in um, uh, French and it was translated uh, late in the day um, in English and um, I suppose not to the same. Um, is more a, a, a fine arts um, uh, aesthetics type of audience and less to a, a philosophical audience unless you're interested in in, uh, uh, in everything that Lyotard said. So there are his three phases and it's very interesting to see um, the moves from uh, extreme uh, libidinal phase which hits the um, boundary of being potentially um, uh, too relativist, correcting with um, the the linguistic turn. Um, all these French people are, uh, uh, I would say, La Lacan, uh, Foucault, uh, Deleuze, um, and others had um, at one time when in their career, or in their thought path, when they were trying to um, go beyond the limits of what they had said, uh, had a linguistic turn. In um, uh, France, it was a turn towards enunciative linguistics. So there was a, you can see it in, in, in Lacan, there's a first turn to a linguistic turn, which is to Saussure. Um, but there's a second turn later on when, um, uh, he's trying to go beyond the symbolic to the real, where he's talking, um, um, he's not renouncing the Saussurean stuff, but he's going into en enunciation. And that was a big thing in um, France, enunciative uh, linguistics. And uh, the problem there is uh, it can seem to explain everything. Um, uh, and lead to a sort of um, linguistic idealism. And then you need something more to go beyond. So in Lacan, it's the drive. In um, uh, Lyotard, uh, it's when he deals with, um, with painting. I think the moral is we're meant to find um, those three um, uh, levels of analysis in our own life. But um, this um, enunciative turn is something that I, I find um, common to the um, most important French thinkers and, and not really uh, sort of emphasised in, in English. So that's um, Lyotard in a nutshell. Any questions or, or remarks? I can't hear anything. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I uh, 
I was talking this whole time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, so the first phase, he was too relativist, so he kind of adjusts it, and in his adjustment, he gets into this uh, he, this sort of linguistic turn. Um, and I had two questions about it. Well, one is about phase one, one is about phase two. Phase two, I just, I don't, I'm not that well-versed in Derrida, but my vague recollection of, of grammatology was, um, it's like everybody was making this move to prioritizing parol over long, and then yes. Derrida's like, eh, false binary, RK writing, actually. Uh, so there's always the writing before the speech um, in the sense that, like, I don't know, like, I, like you're kind of processing things ahead of time. I'm speaking very loosely, very zoomed out here. Okay. And it, it, this phase uh, is, is, is Lyotard uh, implicated by that critique? Or uh, is does that does he come does his phase with the linguistic turn come after of grammatology in a way that uh, his his phase comes um uh, quite a way after of grammatology, which for me was in the late sixties, and his linguistic phase sort of begins um in at the beginning of um the eighties, so okay. he takes uh, Derrida into a, a account. Um, but uh, his um, focus of interest in language is um, different. And um, I think he must have influenced uh, Derrida because um, everything becomes um, sentences and phrases, but there are different regimes of phrases that you can't get rid of. And one of the um, uh, regimes is at the basis of ethics. It's, it's the pre prescriptive uh, regime. So language has prescription in it. There's a book I, I should have prepared. I want to show you. It'll take me a second to find it, I think. Bonus. Um, Based bonus no, Asia uh, Swarm content. Let's go. I can't <laughs> find the book. It's yo, what's up, listener or viewer? Yo, yo, yo. How you doing? So I noticed you sitting there um, watching this video. Yep. We'll and yeah you're you're listening you're you're paying attention um you're definitely not hearing everything we're saying though yeah. nope definitely not you're not taking notes <laughs> yeah take notes dude what are you doing <laughs> hey you know um, what if you want to do hey if you want to be passive and just enjoy this content while multitasking that's what we do as well everyone does that most of the time we very rarely uh, switch into this more active mode, and and that's fine. That's fine because you're kind of absorbing this content as you go through your life, and that and that's great. But if you're going to do that, then we just have a little request of you. What what's our little request, Nance? We want you to do the algorithm things. We want you to hit the button, the thumbs up. Uh, I mean, or the thumbs down. Uh, hit the subscribe button. You could even hit the bell so so you get notified when there's a an epic marathon stream yep. uh, or one of the dope ass interviews. We just finished a dope ass interview. Absolutely. Um, but, but do the things to, to help train your algorithm to actually give you content um, that you prefer. And at least here we're, we're, we are aware of the problem. We are aware that we're all infected with the algorithm and we're trying to do something about it. Um, so while you can like maintain a cynical distance of like not being an enthusiastic vocal supporter, Right. Doing those like doing those actions actually um it first of all it helps the channel, it helps Theory it Underground. Does. Um, but it helps your algorithm too. You will get less kind of shitty clickbait react content if you train your algorithm um to give you what you prefer. I mean, you're already here, you're already yeah. watching this. Yeah. How, and like, so en enthusiastic, unironic, genuine support might be a little too much for some of you who are way too cool for that kind of thing but you can at least hit the little like button and then we'll say we're even okay there we go you owe us nothing now yeah let's get back to it uh, um it's called logic of Le levinas logic de uh, levinas and that was um uh, sick a couple of manuscripts that um Lyotard wrote at the same time that he was preparing the uh, different and the idea is that um, ethics is 
incommensurable with um, uh, referential statements, but um, cannot be eliminated. Okay. So that was his um, mistake, his great mistake in his libidinal phase. Okay. And so despite the fact that there's um, the risk of idealism, linguistic idealism, there's no longer any risk of um, uh, uh, relativism. Okay. So we'll, if if there was a, a philosophical danger, it would be um, a, a, a non-relativist uh, idealism that would be the the um, degenerate form of his uh, um, different philosophy. So obviously he doesn't agree that it's idealism, um, but uh, so we all have to decide on what we think of, uh, of that. So as long after, I think when uh, there are those started saying that um, um, the one thing that is undeconstructible is justice, which is very strange, um, given that everything seemed to be deconstructible before, and suddenly right. uh, Derrida makes uh, statements like that. I and think that's because that he became be... a Levinasian. Yes. Well, he was always uh, um, influenced by Levinas, but um, I think maybe he was influenced by Levinas and also by uh, uh, Leo, Leotard's take on uh, Levinas. Okay. So um, there was a... Uh, a big symposium um, at the beginning of um, the 80s on the faculty of judgment. And Derrida uh, proposed a contribution. I think it was around the work of Lyotard, and uh, Lyotard um, made a contribution. And um, they were all, this is the beginning of the 80s, they were all into um, uh, uh, ethics and, and justice as um, uh, pushing their philosophy even further. Okay. All right. And then the other question was just, oh, and it, this is not less of a question and more of a, I understand part of the issue with uh, libidinal economy is that he calls, well, the, he's, it's a, it, it is understood as being anti-worker, anti-socialist, anti-communist, and uh, that's because he's saying the worker loves his oppression and then he calls Marx a little girl and there's like this whole like very anti-socialist and very like, okay, we've got these dumb people who love their jobs kind of. Uh, but that's, that's Lacan. That's um, uh, people who get their enjoyment or their jouissance everywhere, including in their jobs. Yeah. I don't think uh, uh, it's an argument that um, uh, enjoyment cannot be the criterion for correct um, ethical or political action because enjoyment is distributed everywhere. So um, the stuff on um, Marx and a little girl, I would have to reread to see what uh, that's about. But um, I think... Uh, it's funny. It's funny stuff. It's really... By Althusser. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But... Uh, with that, I think that for the sake of time, we should move into the next one here. So, okay, the next one is maybe um, uh, Michel Serre. Um, uh, he's been through three phases. So, his thesis um, in uh, France has been uh, abolished now. You had a uh, an ordinary um, uh, doctorate, which corresponds roughly to what exists in the English speaking world, and then you had a state doctorate, which was a level um, beyond. It had to, it was a longer, uh, um, was a level of um, um, uh, philosophical um, power and creativity. Um, it had to make a contribution. So difference and repetition uh, by Deleuze was uh, the, his thesis for the state doctorate. Um, uh, Michel Serre, uh, Michel Serre's state doctorate was on uh, the philosophy of Leibniz, and he drew um, a, lots of his ideas from um, uh, playing around with um, uh, Leibniz, which he considered to um, give him the tools for a philosophy of um, communication and networks. So he wrote a series of books. They're called Hermes. There are five of them. 
The first one is communication. It's just been translated by a, a friend of mine uh, who lives in Paris, Louise Birchall. Um, but what is most interesting for me is um, uh, Hermes 4 and 5. So that was basically at the end of the 60s and through the 70s. So Hermes 4 and 5 um, reverses the perspective that you've got communication networks and they try to fight noise. And then in uh, Hermes 4 and 5, uh, Ser be begins to analyze um, the noise and find that that's um, more interesting. And once he's sort of gone as far as he can in analytic um, terms with that, um, the next step was um, the parasite, where he starts adopting um, a more uh, literary style. He takes uh, fables from La Fontaine and elsewhere. And the parasite in um, French, a parasite is, uh, as in English, a biological parasite, but it's also um, noise or interference. So um, he gets um, uh, a lot of fun playing around with the fact that it has these two meanings. And so it goes um, with the end of his Hermes phase where he had noise as um, being a um, primary over the, the networks of communication. And then my uh, sort of under, understanding of what that text was um, made me want to look into it as a form of post-Marxism or, or post-socialism. And so I looked into it and then I was like, it's a bunch of stories about animals. And I, and I, I just, <laughs> I, wa I wasn't in the mood for stories about animals, yes. but, I, but I've always wanted someone to crack it for me. But basically my understanding is that it's just, he's saying uh, humans and basically all systems are just parasites and it's parasites all the way down, just like turtles all the way down, but it's parasites, parasites all the way down. All the way down. Uh, I think he was beginning to be influenced by um, um, René Girard at that time. They were great pals, and uh, he wrote more and more Girardian texts. So um, uh, there's so, this um, so he was magnetic uh, uh, rivalry as noise as well. So he was getting that those Peter Thiel bucks. Is that right? Yes. Nice. Probably Peter Thiel would, would like that phase. Um, plus, there's the notion of noise as being both destructive and um, potentially creative, so mm -hmm. creative destruction. His, his politics, he doesn't talk about politics very much in the ordinary sense. His politics is, um, uh, to say the least, um, ambiguous because he doesn't deal with it. So um, uh, I don't think if you're politically um, looking for political messages uh you can get much directly from him he could sort of theorize it and combine it with um something else but um a greater perspective but uh i don't think it's it's worth um mining him for political lessons or criticizing him for um for political lessons um his big thing was um uh, he told me this uh that um uh, the French thinkers up to him uh, were mainly concerned with politics and uh, and um, the human sciences, and they knew nothing about the physical sciences. So his big thing was to um, uh, ph philosophize the um, physical sciences and show the passages between the physical sciences and the and the human sciences. So um, when he gets to the parasite, that's where he becomes imagistic in his style. And he's trying to work and speak from the, um, the between of um, uh, physical sciences and mathematics as well, and um, the human sciences. Yeah. And I think the best book on that um, in that phase, he did a series of, series of books, three books, um, called the Book of Foundations. So it's Rome, um, statues, and I think the other one's the Origins of Geometry. They're all translated. And um, uh, it's just 
for anyone interested in um, uh, multiplicities and in a storytelling um, style, he takes um, the the books of uh, of Titus Livy's History of Rome, the, um, from the mythical beginnings with Hercules, and um, uh, there are eight chapters. Um, Black Box, the Trampled Multiplicity, City of Alba, the White Multiplicity, Empire, the Fragmented Multiplicity, Suffrage, the Assembled Multiplicity, Aeneas, uh, Stabines, Tarquins, Coriolanus, the Composite Multiplicity, Wars and Play, the Multiplicity in Representation, and then in Crowds, in the City, the Agitated Multiplicity, and the uh, conclusion in the field, the multiplicity in peace. So we're going from warlike multiplicities or violent multiplicities at the beginning to um, end with peaceful multiplicities. Um, he did, um, that was in the 80s. So he, he wrote um, quite a few books that were um, full of stories and, and, and fables and um, managed to express uh, his philosophy uh, uh, directly in that sort of uh, literary style. And then um, at the beginning, I think, uh, maybe in the middle of the um, 90s, he went to a, a new phase and um, he started talking about uh, uh, the, the great story or the grand narrative. And I think he had been teaching at um, Stanford and he was upset by these Leotardians who said, oh, there's no grand narrative. of." Um, and so um, his idea was, yes, today we do have a grand narrative. Um, we've got the history of the universe from the Big Bang up to now with the theory of evolution as well. And, um, well, I don't think, I mean, he never bothered to actually read Leotard. And uh, he always talks about the the grand narrative of science and all the other um, uh, valuable literary works and scientific works fit into that narrative. Um, Lyotard's exact term was grand narrative of legitimation, um, which was once again, there's no um, universal description that is at the same time uh, universally valid prescription. So, um, uh, Sayre affects to forget or not notice that there was this ethical dimension to Lyotard, and he goes full on um, the idea that everything is networks and communication and noise, and with that, um, or is at least related to that, so we can um, look at our whole cosmology and evolutionary theory. And so there's a series of books that have been, many of them have been translated. So that's um, uh, Hominescence. Uh, there's um, The Incandescent, uh, Branches, and that's his um, uh, last phase where uh, it's full of stories, but with sort of um, uh, meditations. And um, the idea is not to encumber one's books with um, refer references, because if you know, um, you can fill in the references yourselves. And if you don't know, um, that will be um, some sort of um, uh, block to um, reading the book when you can understand it without all the references. So um, he was constantly aiming at a, um, a, a popular audio, so cultivated but popular. So that's his third phase. Mm. And um, that's where he became more interested in ecology. So I think um, uh, Biogia and uh, before that, the natural contract, uh, um, the natural outcome of, of this this last uh, phase of, of the of the great narrative. So um, 
is most interesting to me in the middle phase, the 80s with all the, the, the storytelling books. And um, recently there was a manuscript published. Uh, it was, um, uh, it took uh, the, fable, uh, the fables of La Fontaine and it's a book of philosophical commentary on selected fables of uh, La Fontaine. So it's been published in French. It was a manuscript that was finished uh, uh, before his death, which must be about, I don't know, four or five years ago. And um, that goes, harkens back to this middle period, which is the period that I, um, I find the most interesting because it's less moralistic. As he grew older, he became very moralistic. He was invited uh, um, onto uh, uh, various uh, TV talk shows because you get or it's sort of uh, dying out now, but you've got real philosophers being invited to TV talk shows um, a decade ago. Um, and um, he was mainly the voice of wisdom. And um, I found that um, not the best... Uh, advertisement for um, reading his works and reflected a change in the tonality of his works. But I mean, I don't know how old he, he lived to a ripe old age, so maybe he had the right to be um, uh, a wise old man at the end. Well, and it kind of seems like uh, that's a change that Latour also takes. Uh, they both and it's because they both care about climate change, right? So they both kind of wanted to get more yes. involved in public policy. So that's the political phase as well. Um, uh, Bruno Latour was was less a wise old man, but um, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we shall say uh, uh, he could lay it on a bit thick, and uh, I, I didn't like it at the end. But um, uh, that's the point of convergence. Uh, you told me that you were reading or had read the interviews um, between the Bruno Latour interviewed Michel Serre. It was what's right. What's the name of the book in? I think it's English. called Conversations. With, Just Conversations, yes. Yeah, my my quick. So before we move into the Latour phase of this, uh, I wanted to give Nance a, a, a moment here to 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 ask anything he wants about Serres uh, Serres because I. But I'll but I'll say one thing, and that's anecdotal. Uh, I was at a conference uh, during my undergraduate uh, in Hawaii. Uh, this was when I had realized that there was free money in the budget at all the departments and colleges for students to travel to conferences, and so I got good at sending emails to everybody, being like, "Hey, I want to go to a conference. Can you fund it?" And then various departments would go here's 250 here's 500 and so i was able to get enough to go to hawaii for the uh east west philosophers conference that happens uh uh in honolulu and it's you know it's it was like their 40th anniversary or something like that and i don't know i for, i presented on heidegger or something like that i don't even remember but uh Sir, Sir came up uh because i saw this wonderful presentation uh this might have been yeah i think it was a french guy uh and uh and he was talking about uh natural semiotics so i i, I think if i remember right the i i've always kind of just had Surer as like this guy who i could go to uh when i'm ready to get more into how there are language systems in nature um, and maybe our own language systems have some kind of a relation to those ones. I'm not sure. Um, I, I just have some kind of a vague sense that that's a thing. Is that, does that ring a bell for you? Does that sound like his third phase? Yes. Or something? Uh, in, um, that's even there um, from, yeah, maybe in his third uh, phase, uh, he sort of um, synthesizes his past work on inf information um, and gets a cosmology out of that. Mm -hmm. So um, everything is, in that sense, semiotic, including um, um, the, the natural world. Everything is based on um, uh, 
information flow and emission and uh, capture. The physical universe itself is based on that. So there is, to that uh, extent, at the ontological level, um, a continuity. There, um, uh, semiotics is at all the levels. Awesome. Cool. And what would be the best and book thanks. for that? What would be the best book for that? The best for book that for thesis? that? Uh, I don't know. The best books, uh, so there are a couple of books where he synthesized everything, um, but they're not translated. Uh, I'm not sure. Hermes One was just translated, but it's, um, for me, it's too old. Uh, the, there are maybe hominescence. Somewhere in the middle, um, there's this book. It's the Troubadour of Knowledge. I'm not so sure that it's um, it's a philosophy of education. Um, he, he goes into his life. Um, uh, he talks about um, combining well, the left hand and the right hand and so human sciences and um, uh, uh, physical sciences. It may not be exactly on that, but it's quite readable. It's um, 160 pages, and it's a fast read. He really tried to write something simple. Uh, on the specific question um, of everything uh, being, uh, in in the sense we talked about, semiotic, uh, I would have to say, it's books. You, uh, I don't know all the titles. It will be books in this series, but you would have to sort of pick and choose because he sort of um, almost every book he has to explain the Big Bang and and the evolution of everything in the universe. Um, uh, this one I see. Uh, I've got it um, in French, but um, it seems to be. Um, he talks about. Uh, the event of communication, uh, the three loops that lead up to uh, man is not a finished product, but there's hominescence, like adolescence. So um, one of these books uh, sort of repeat each other. So one of the books in this series, maybe a shorter one, I think um, okay. The Incandescent is probably good. It's shorter and he's... I think it came later and he digested things more. So that will be, um, I mean, I'm just guessing that it will be good for, for that question. Cool. And then what about you, Nance? I, uh, there's actually a lot, um, but I don't want to hijack the rest of the time remaining. I guess the, the one thing I want to, I don't know, note is that I find it interesting that with, generative ai models the the way they work is by denoising like like when you uh propose a prompt or whatever to to a model it starts with just a field of noise and then it kind of subducts from there to kind of come up with the end product um and i find that interesting to to play with the noise in communication um we've now instrumentalized that and kind of turned that into a monetizable product and i think it's interesting um yeah i think i want to go on a deep dive through share now yeah man well yeah even from the beginning you should read um um even i think um uh communication um the hermes one which is just been translated because that's he takes um uh, his theory of dialogue, uh, which he finds in um, uh, the Socratic dialogues already, the dialogue um, is based on denoising um, uh, to get optimum communication, and um, the noise is always the third point of view. So um, you're excluding the third point of view all the time for mm -hmm. um, both positive results and um, uh, overly uh, reductive results. 
Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's get into the last phase of this then uh, before we bring on uh, Walter Ben Michaels here in 13 minutes. Let's 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 jump into uh, Bruno Latour. So, uh, what do you, what do you, what can you tell us about about Bruno Latour? I'll just preface it by saying that he came up in the Totality and Infinity course. Uh, because of what I've been, you know, I'm teaching sociology. I'm interested in this line between sociology and anthropology. Um, I'm interested in uh, sociologists or anthropologists who question that line uh, or, or problematize it in various ways uh, because I think that the complexity of, of modern society itself challenges that distinction. And so when we're thinking about participation, Levy Brule, uh, you know, uh, the primitive mentality uh, and the critiques of that, uh, but also the kernel of truth that it gets at. And the question for me, a critical media theory question of uh, what would what, what does it mean if we're if we're entering a, a phase of digital participation or e-participation? Um, and that's when uh, that's when Terence was like, Latour is really good for this in his in his. Uh, what what is the what is the name of the book? You were just waving it around a second ago. Inquiry into modes of existence. All right, yeah, and so that's the newest phase of his of his work. But now that's gonna... the middle phase. That's the phase what? that everyone neglects. What everybody knows um, the science um, and networks phase, and everyone knows the um, the climate um, uh, politics phase. Okay, but in the middle, there's. Um, uh, this uh, inquiry into modes of existence. So um, maybe it's good uh, uh, just to go through. I, in each case, I've, I've chosen three phases. Um, one of the most famous books is um, at the beginning of um, his uh, publishing career. He published a book uh, with, um, what's his name? Uh, Wood, uh, this is very bad. Um, Woodward, um, called uh, L Laboratory Life. And the interesting thing is, um, he didn't do his military service at all. There was a thing called, there's a civil service, which instead of one year, you do two years for civil service. And he was in Africa and um, he learned the methods of anthropology. At the same time, he was. Um, uh, in uh this came out in later um autobiographical pieces he was um in one study group um for Altazer's writings and uh, another year maybe the first year and the second year um a study group uh, around anti oedipus and then he got a job um uh to go to the Salk Institute uh in um California and to do a sociological, or for him it was an anthropological um, study of the Salk laboratories. So it was a uh, one of the first um, um, cases of an anthro uh, case studies of an anthropological study of a laboratory. So um, he. Um, He's not a relativist, although once again, he was accused of being a, a, a relativist and he had to find ways of um, getting around the objection. Um, but he did a sort of phenomenological uh, reduction and suspended the idea of um, this is objectivity, this is um, the way we um, get to truth. And he just studied um, everything that was going on in the um, uh, uh, laboratory that he was studying. And this is where he came up with his theory of um, actor networks. So this um, was developed and theorized and synthesized in um, several books, but this one, Science in Action, is very pedagogical and has sort of little um, uh, uh, graphics and little boxes for important points. And um, uh, he, that's where he lays out his theory of actor networks, which he found underlied his anthropo anthropological approach. And then to get around the uh, relativism objection, he started thinking about, uh, yes, everything's networks, but 
um, what flows along the networks. And he decided um, the different things flowed along different um, uh, networks. So um, fact producing flowed along scientific networks, which evolved far more than actual uh, theoretical science, but uh, funding, um, uh, uh, political um, uh, affiliations and interventions and all sorts of things. So um, it was al al already seeing that everything um, contains hybridization. There's no pure network, but there are qualitative um, differences. So that's where um, he did uh, do individual case studies of the um, uh, in French, I'm not uh, sure how it's translated into English, the fabrication of law um, and um, uh, uh, a project for a metro um, uh, rail um, underground that, that uh, was well out of the way and then was abandoned. And uh, in a book on uh, religious, um, from his own personal point of view on religious practice called um, uh, Rejoice. Um, and all these case studies added up to um, an inquiry into modes of existence. So uh, this is where he synthesizes all the different uh, case studies into 15 modes of existence. And um, this is where uh, he's, I said maybe he was relevant to uh, uh, Levinas, although he um, doesn't develop uh, an ethical uh, mode of existence, but he does develop a religious mode of existence. And the whole idea is these modes of existence are irreducible, incommensurable and irreducible and ineliminable if we want to remain who we are. So um, uh, we're not really modern in the self-image that we have of ourselves because participation and hybridation are part of our existence. And that's what he calls um, the metamorphic mode of existence. And um, uh, just, just we find it elsewhere in, in watching TV and films and in psychoanalysis, um, in participating in the um, audience for football matches and so on. All that will be part of uh, a metamorphic existence. Uh, there's the referential mode of existence that is uh, mobilized by um, uh, science. There's technological mode of existence because he um, draws a wedge between um, science and uh, technology. And there's the religious mode of existence, which um, is based on a sort of hermeneutic continuity going all, all the way back um, to, well, in his case, the Bible, but in transforming the message all the way along. And that's the mode of love as well. And I had a big conflict um, with him about that, uh, where I claimed that there was no need for a, uh, a separate mode of existence called uh, the religious, uh, that it was just one sector of the metamorphic. And uh, he got very upset about that and banished me from his website. But finally, um, when he published a, a, a book, a big book of um, contributions to his project called Reset Modernity. He invited me to uh, contribute a chapter where I took basically that argument and he published it. So he's a pluralist and unlike other pluralists, yes, I'm sure other pluralists, if you said the um, uh, exact opposite on a key point, they would pretend you didn't exist or, or come around and beat you up with a few friends. But um, he he was an ethical pluralist that he um, ever published uh, my article. So that shows that he's um, sincere in his convictions. And after that, 
separating out all the different modes of existence. All along, he was talking about nature and um, ecology and so on. And um, he gave a series of lectures that became a book. It's called Facing Gaia. So um, he deals with the origins of science and the different ways science can function. There's a, a big problem. Of course, many people, uh, they just see a title and that's enough. Oh, he talks about Gaia, all that hippie, uh, woo-woo stuff. But he really um, uh, explains what he means by Gaia, and it's nothing to do with some sort of unified um, uh, consciousness. And he uh, takes up um, uh, James Lovelock, and he tries to argue that people haven't understood him, and it's all to do with sort of um, physical parameters and um, the can... Uh, make us bifurcate into uh, a different state of the earth. And it's nothing to do with the earth being conscious of itself or with a, a goddess of, of nature. So I think he does a good job of that. Anyone who thinks he's being uh, hippie, uh, they're just not reading um, uh, what he's writing. They're just sort of fantasizing on, on a couple of words that they pick out. So that's his last phase. He became very engaged. Um, uh, uh, politically um, in terms of um, uh, all the changes that we have to make to our way of life to um, avoid uh, uh, a full-fledged um, uh, crisis that, that gets rid of humans. Um, and some of that was tied to his religious um, uh, beliefs. He came um, came out more and more as a Catholic, but um, uh, most of it is is um, totally independent of that. That we can see that as the motor, but not as the um, uh, the ethical motor, but not the conceptual motor. So um, there are all the pieces that were um, the short, tiny uh, pamphlets he published at the end of his life because uh, he was. I don't know how old he was. He was in his um, late 70s or early 80s. And um, uh, he was getting sicker and sicker. So he he, uh, he didn't want to give up on, on, on that struggle. So that's, uh, once again, a sign of being committed to his ideas and to his, uh, to his ethics. You're muted. Again. Thank you so much, Terrence. We're going to continue this. If you've got a sec in the green room, uh, Nance will have some follow-up questions for you there. And then that addendum can be added to this or released as a standalone episode soon. But for now, thank you so much for joining this M Stew. Everybody will be right back with Walter Ben Michaels, who is the author of the Problem with Diversity, as well as No Politics But Class Politics, published with Dr. Adolf Reed Jr. right after this. We cannot do direct revolution. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of letting others read and think on their behalf, slipstreaming our way into an understanding of the situation that short circuits the deadlocks of our moment. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. What that has meant in the last year is traveling across the United States, into Canada, and then all over Europe to promote our books, courses, and ideas related to time energy and underground theory. You've been reading Underground Theory. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. 
An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing, but first I had to get freed from wage labor, which was achieved this year. That's right. Thanks to my monthly seminar subscribers, I was able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. Now I'm announcing the next big phase of the plan, which is the Mikey Down Seminar. What monthly subscribers to the Mikey Seminar are paying for is a survey of philosophy, including deep dives into Zizek, Lan, Lacan, Baudrillard, Bataille, Leotard, and ultimately the whole history of philosophy. We're trying to build like this ongoing seminar, right? And that, that's what I really like about this thing, where, you know, if I'm teaching a main text, that's something I got to focus on. I got to really, but the seminar thing, we can do this stuff all the time where we dive deeper into concepts, we dive deeper into certain you know sections of books or whatever and we can really do this nuanced stuff i think that there's probably no better way for us to accelerate our learning in these areas than by slipstreaming mikey and that has been my belief for years and years and years now it's official you're able to help out you're able to get involved you're able to benefit directly from liberating him from wage labor get on it right now do it D- just go stop what you're doing go click the button subscribe that's this is what you do subscribe to him if you're already signed up for the ongoing theory underground seminars then that's the ones that i do with my wife Anne. though that's getting an upgrade which means that I will be doing one session per month that is just me. And then I will also be doing the ones with Anne, which are a crash course in sociology, anthropology, the social sciences, and ultimately Marx, Heidegger, Levinas, Bourdieu, imminently critiquing pop psychology, sociology, self-help, and ultimately the doxa of our time. But if you would like to be a subscriber to both Mikey's seminar and the seminar that the Snellgrove McCarrickers are doing, then the best way is to become a tier four subscriber, or you can be a tier two subscriber to each of us. The reason this matters is because tier two is like pretty much the best bang for your buck. It gives you huge discounts on all of the courses that we do. But uh, if you can't afford it, tier four is amazing because it gives you tier three access at both Mikey's seminar and ours. Finally, not everybody has time to be part of these ongoing research seminars, and they just want to fund the paid content for the YouTube and podcast. And so thank you so, so much to our patrons over at Patreon. They're the ones funding all the free stuff. So big thank you to Bert, Marilyn, Carl, Heel, Zozandra, Nikolai, Darian, Tyler, and Mandeep, and all the other wonderful patron people, uh, patrons. 
Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. Thank you so much to all of you patrons and also to the special subscribers and the paying subscribers. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just so awkward. Thank you, Patreon. Patrons. Thank you. Pat- oh, okay. And to all the other wonderful patrons. Thank you so much, all you patrons. And also a special thanks to the subscribers on the YouTube side as well as the paying subscribers over at Substate. Why can't we do this? Fuck. <laughs> you guys. Please. Just thank you. Thank you, everyone, for making this bullshit possible. Thank you to the subscribers. You do it. You did so good. Thanks, guys.